Well, first of all, thank you very much um, for having me here, for giving me this award. This is a great honor. Uh, I'm very delighted and, to be here with you and share uh, my research experience with you. So I'm also grateful that uh, my dear former boss and mentor and now dear friend Francis um, set the stage for what I'm going to talk about. So I would like to explore a little bit with you the phenotypic side of our research field. So I think whenever we talk about research, we typically talk about the scientific advances, the molecular advances, what technology can do. But I think we very often forget um, the more obvious, uh, the things that are, very, that are closer to the patient. And that is the clinical presentation, that is the phenotype. And I think that is something we should always keep in mind and should always focus on. And when you talk about phenotype, there are many possibilities. So of course, we all talk, we all study the categorical phenotypes that are defined by DSM or ICD-10 criteria, um, that is bipolar, schizophrenia, and all the other diagnoses you know. Then there's the other area, another area that deals with endophenotypes, like neuropsychological endophenotypes, that are supposed to be closer to the underlying biology. And now there's a new concept that was put forth by the NMH, which incorporates that endophenotype concept to a certain degree. Uh, these, these are the research domain criteria. So this, these are all phenotypic um, aspects. What I would like to focus on are uh, pharmacological phenotypes and basically uh, that is lithium response and Francis already talked about this and something that I think is, some, is very often overlooked, the disease course, disease trajectories as a phenotype um, of special importance. So I, uh, Francis set the stage here and talked about our endeavor in terms of finding genes for lithium response. So when we started that was in 2008, we gathered a group of researchers from all over the world that worked in bipolar disorder research, but that also worked in lithium research. Lithium being the mainstay of uh, maintenance treatment in um, bipolar disorder. However, unfortunately, in many countries in the world, um, especially in the more um, developed world where companies are also trying to sell their medications, this cheap drug is not so much used anymore. And, um, but, and I'm not saying that it helps everyone, but it does help quite a good share of people. And so I think this is it's a prime example of, of, of a medication to study in pharmacogenetic studies. So we brought together a group of researchers. We sat down at a round table at the NMH and said, look, Let's, let's get this done. Let's find all the samples that are there in the world and, 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 and try to find the genes or start finding genes uh, for the genetics of, of lithium response. So we uh, established what is now known as the Consortium of lithium, on Lithium Genetics or Conligen. There's a website, www.conligen.org. You can check that out. You see all the member countries you see and you click on the flags and you'll see the individual collaborators, their websites or emails. So it's a very uh, open forum and we always invite researchers to join this endeavor. And I want to talk about the phenotype aspect. So in order to define, in order to do a study, you need to define the phenotype. And we went at great lengths to do this. Well, because when you want to define what is lithium response, you really need to have a common la one language. And we're using a scale that was developed by our dear colleague Martin Alder from Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I don't want to go in detail, but you can look that up. That scale is on the website. Here uh, you have two criteria, an A criterion and the B criteria, five. Here you basically assess whether lithium helped alleviate the symptoms, helped reduce suicidality, helped reduce psychotic events. And here you check whether what you see here is actually due to lithium, because you check for compliance, you check for uh, the number of episodes before lithium, you check for other medication, just to, to make an educated guess whether what you see is due to lithium. And then you have an A score and a B score, and you can subtract the A from the B score, and you get what is known then as the total ALDA score, because developed by Martin Alda. 
We did this in this consortium all over the world, but when you do this, you have to bring researchers together, they have to um, apply the same stringency, and of course, they, we, we have to establish an inter reliability, and we did this uh, with case vignettes that were sent to all the centers all over the world, more than 20 centers in four continents, and we came up with cutoffs for the um, ALDA scale, and we came up with two phenotypes, the dichotomous one, the, the total score can go up to 10, and we divided it into uh, a score above seven and anything below seven, or seven and above and below, meaning good response and the, and the remainder being partial or non-response. But we also came up with a continuous uh, trait where we used the A score in individuals where the B score was no greater than four. So and with that, we said, uh, we started, we did this in 2012, 13, that took a while to send all these case vignettes all over the world and you get the feedback and do the analyses. And you see in the, in the time, uh, in those three years, um, the, the, the sample, of the, the, the group of researchers had already grown. And uh, so we published the phenotype first. We said this is the phenotype we are gonna use down the road. And now, what we have done now is do the actual analysis, and Francis already presented that. It is now the largest genome-wide association study for lithium response. And Francis showed that slide uh, in a different form. Basically, when, a genome -wide, when you do a genome-wide association study, you have all those half a million markers, or then you have actually, when you can extrapolate, you have even more markers, and each bar represents a chromosome, and that is the magical threshold of uh, genome-wide significance because when you do so many tests, you have to correct for them, and only the mac markers that surpass that threshold are actually the ones that you can consider robust markers. We found those four markers, uh, and actually, the, for instance, show that slide. These markers are the ones that are within genes that code for long non-coding RNA, and Francis already said that they might have something to do, we don't really know yet, uh, with G DNA regulation. So this is something for further research down the road. And um, as we could show in our paper, the, the people, the, the few individuals that had those response alleles did a lot better in a prospective trial in terms of time to relapse. relapse. So this was actually sort of a, like a replication. It's a different phenotype we used here, but a sort of a proof of concept that what we found kind of worked. And that helped us um, also published that uh, this year in The Lancet. And I think what I would like to um, point out to you is also that this field can only thrive if we work together in huge collaborations. And th because this was only possible through the contribution of researchers from all over the world, people who never got any dime to do that, to recruit those patients. We only got funding to do the genotyping. But eight years of clinical work of interviewing the patients was not um, accounted for by any grants. So, and, and so, that so many clinicians and basic researchers chipped in, put in their efforts, and um, Lancet honored that by putting up 124, 124 offers for the first time in the history of that prestigious journal. And I think that's where we have to go in order to keep doing what we want to do. We need to inspire researchers from all the world and also acknowledge their contributions. And actually now we want to go broader. We're gonna, we, we had a training in, in Lima, Peru for uh, Latin America where we trained uh, research clini clinicians in the rating scale. Uh, we also went to Khartoum, Sudan. A great folks there, 100 people turned out. They did the lithium ratings better than all of us before, so, uh, and they just learned it from me there on the spot, so this was really amazing. Uh, we also went to Ethiopia, where we already have a um, project going on, a genetics project. So all those sites will join, hopefully, once we get funding to do that. So this is now the list of countries, also Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, and Armenia, and, and, and Turkey uh, and Sri Lanka, they all have chipped in. They all have said, look, we have so and so many samples. And we have lithium clinics. We use that drug because it's cheap and it works and we would like to be part of. So this is an inspiring endeavor. We hope that in the next three, four years or so, we'll 
ramp up the sample to another three, or to up to 5,000 or so. And that's, Francis said that this will bring us maybe across, the, above the threshold and we'll find more uh, genes um, to get a better picture of the overall genetic liability. Second point, um, disease trajectories. Um, in our field, we have been obsessed sort of for a century with this notion uh, of um, the Kreppelinian dichotomy. I mean, Emil Kreppelin was the founder sort of psychopathological thinking. And, and of course, due to his work or based on his work, we differentiate between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, considering distinct entities. And of course, there are differences, but we all know there is, there's overlap, and genetics has told us that. So but we are <laughs> always um, talking about this. Is there a dichotomy? Is there not dichotomy? And uh, I think it was nicely put by Nick Craddock and Mike Owen here that it's going, going, but it's still not gone. The question is, do we really have to bother about this, whether it's going and not gone or whatever? Um, I think what, is, what we should also focus on, or should focus on, is, is the course of disorder. It's rarely in the, in, in the focus. All those great efforts that we have done with the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium and so on, we have these huge samples now that have helped identify genes, but they look at a cross-sectional disease state. They, they sample and in the middle at one point in their lifetime. And, but we all know, this is like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression. We just plotted here a few course types. You can have schizophrenia, you can qualify qualify or the, for schizophrenia by having one episode and nothing else. But you can be bipolar and have thousands of episodes and suffer heavily and have severely debilitating episodes. And well, now these are considered distinct disorders. Some people say this is, this is schizophrenia, so it's considered more severe, but maybe this is more severe. So actually, the course is what clinicians look at. We want to see whether a patient comes back to the hospital or not, how often he or she comes back, how frequent the patient, the, the visits, the hospitalizations are. So I think this is a phenotype that we need to study because that's actually what matters to patients, that matters to relatives, to caretakers, and so on. However, that's not easy because you have to follow people for a certain period of time. It's not easy because funding agencies don't have that, you know, that uh, time. They want to see uh, quick results. But here we're talking about a lifetime, or we are maybe at least a few years. We tried to do this. We got some money from the German, um, from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, which is the, prime, the, the, the main German funding body, to establish a cohort um, um, of a longitudinal cohort of patients with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depression. So we don't talk about this dichotomy anymore. And we are collecting, um, we're recruiting samples from several centers in, in Germany and, and Graz, Austria. We have currently um, more than 1,000. We uh, sample them, we see them at 0, 6, 12, and 18 months. We do a thorough interviewing. We uh, do a biobank in DNA, RNA, serum, plasma at each visit. So our biobank has grown to 40,000 samples or so. And it's a huge resource, resource that we haven't even started tapping into. Because, but it's something for, for the future that uh, we all and you know, the whole scientific community can uh, appreciate. So just to give you an, a glimpse of what we just started doing, and um, we looked at 200 individuals out of that 1,000 for, uh, for whom we had already four completed study visits. So it's roughly 50% male, 50 female. This is actually not a sample of, of young individuals. It's like, you know, a good sample, a good naturalistic representation. Uh, people have been sick for uh, quite a number of years, and uh, there are outpatients and there are inpatients um, in the sample. So I think it's a, it's a good naturalistic overview of a patient population. So now what we do, we want to see, we want to phenotype them for quality of life functioning. That's something that is really um, done. People typically look at psychopathology and so on. We do that too, cognition as well. But we also think this is important for outcome. So we look at measures of quality of life, functioning. We have the World Health Organization questionnaire on quality of life. 
um, on global assessment and, and work status. So altogether, it's 28 items. But of course, 28 items, that's quite a lot. So what we try to do is we try to reduce the dimensionality here um, by factor analysis. And this is like for the statistics aficionados. I don't have to go into that. But I want to say that we basically do a factor analysis. And in order to, and, and then we want to get a, a, a dimension that best explains that trajectory. And then we have an individual, for each person, we have that trajectory at each time point. And then we do a clustering, a longitudinal clustering, to see what the course typologies look like. And when you do that, we, 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 do, we see that. So here the faint, like you see these lines, these are basically the time points, 0, 6, 12, and 18 months. And these are individual trajectories. Well, you, of course, there's so much variability, you cannot make sense of that. So we have to do the clustering. And when we apply those stringent methods of clustering, we see that there are three clusters. So we have a cluster of people who enter at a good level of functioning, quality of life, and stay. And we have those that enter at a low level and stay at a low level. And the ones that, forever, for whatever reason, start low and improve. And you know, we did a couple of um, permutations and things like that, and we're still working on that to tweak it a little bit to get, it, to get good, robust results that we want to carry on into replication analyses. So, but you see there are three clusters. And um, that's its longitudinal, clusters of the longitudinal course over 18 months. And what is really interesting is that um, there's no difference in terms of diagnoses. So it's not that the poor cluster is basically, or the cluster with the poor course is only schizophrenia, and the one with the good outcome, good quality of life is bipolar. So this actually, would make Emil Kreppelin spin in his grave, because this is not about this dichotomy issue anymore. We don't see that in, in that course uh, assessment. There's no difference between, uh, between these clusters in terms of sex and age, age and onset. Even the duration of illness is not in there. And there are no center effects. Remember, we had like 20, 16 centers from all over Germany. What we see are in, uh, differences in the global assessment of functioning scale between good and poor, and also um, in, in work status between those different clusters. And now, coming to genetics, um, there's a nice tool now that we have at hand. It's called the polygenic risk score analysis. Because we have those huge consortia samples, we can now uh, assign to each an individual that we do a genotype, genotyping, a genome genotyping on, we can assign each an individual a polygenic risk score that basically characterizes this person's genetic liability and, and to a certain disorder. We use here the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia because that's the largest sample to date we have from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And we want to see whether there is a differential distribution across those clusters. We see that those with a good, um, with a good course, uh, or that stay on this good course, have low, um, uh, so, so those, uh, comparing them to the ones with a poor course, you see that the ones with a poor course have a higher polygenic loading. We yet have to find a way to interpret this, so the ones that have actually that improve actually have the lowest polygenic risk score. This is, of course, the smallest sample, and you know, we are now uh, ramping up the sample to like 500, so we'll see whether that stays. But you can see there is a differential um, uh, distribution of genetic liability. And what is interesting is we are now also doing that um, with, with domains of psychopathology and cognition. We don't see a differential. Uh, we also see clusters, but we don't see a differential um, distribution in terms of psychopathology. So all these things that we typically uh, talk about, uh, delusions uh, and, and, and hallucinations, all these things, maybe there's not so much of a genetic bearing than we initially thought. And maybe other factors like quality of life are much more under genetic control than, than these um, psychopathological domains that psychiatrists like to study so often. So we want to also explore other methods to model trajectories. We are working with machine learning methods. We now want to use those trajectories that we identified for proteomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, metabolomics, and all these other omics approaches that are now coming out. 
And I think, yes, that's, that's good because this is, again, the technology part. You know, we have all those technological tools. They get cheaper. We should explore them. But we should explore them in conjunction with uh, good knowledge of the clinical presentation. And here we chose the trajectorial uh, course. And I, I also think, uh, so this is now, again, back to BBRF and back to NARSAT. Uh, it is great that a postdoc in my group just this year got a uh, award, young investigator. He was part of that. And he proposed to study uh, the proteomics profiles in, in those course typologies, in those clusters. We want to see whether there's, there are different patterns in, uh, when, you when you compare those different patterns of proteomics, proteome patterns, when you compare those clusters. So and, and I'm glad that this is sort of the next generation. And given that this is a huge research we have, this next generation will have a lot of work to do. So um, with that, I want to thank uh, my team in Munich. I want to thank so many other colleagues and just a, 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 just a few people here that have uh, worked with me over the many years and all the funding agencies. And I th would like to, that, that was, no, well, you saw it, it was the Kaufman Hall. So, well, thank you very much. Thomas, I have to ask you, that's an astounding finding that these three different outcome categories, there are no differences in the phenotypes? That's right. Schizophrenia, depression, right. and bipolar? So far, I must say that depression sample is not in there. It's bipolar and schizophrenia. The oh, depression bipolar will, yeah, right, 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 right. Depression will come at a later stage. We haven't had the sample size yet for that. OK, yes, a couple of questions yet. Yes, Hi there, thank you so much. This is actually pertains to a child, and so I, it's not directly related to your, it seems like you're following people over time who are more adult age, but um, I'm actually a school psychologist and work with a six-year-old child and have worked with her for over a year. She presents with symptoms of bipolar disorder. Her mood fluctuates. She's very angry, then very happy. She um, can stay very upset for an hour or more at a time, screaming, crying, hysterical. She's in a public school where she's been hospitalized recently they actually, um, she's been diagnosed with mood dysregulation disorder and ADHD. When she was recently hospitalized, she was given Adderall. So she no longer is extremely active, but she still is emotionally disturbed. And still, and it, it's as if she doesn't have Adderall in her system once any trigger comes up, which is benign, and you can never predict what it's going to be. The thing I was wondering is, um, would you diagnose someone who's that age, that young, with bipolar, or is it just mood dysregulation disorder? And, and I know you don't know her, but in general, just in general, do you use bipolar disorder as a diagnosis at that age group okay. and then I guess it, it just uh, is so disconcerting because um, you, I was wondering would you recommend using lithium with a young population again not about her individually but just children that young age oh so there's so many questions so many aspects and there are so politically charged in, in a way so coming from Germany of course I could say well that's what the Americans do right they uh, we don't do this um, oh, first of all, we know from our studies that mood disorders start at a much earlier age than many people would think. And there are, um, there are symptoms that, in hindsight, you find out are part of that whole spectrum. So I wouldn't deny um, that there is a uh, true bipolar phenotype that can exist. However, I mean, this is a real, this is a big discussion, right, in this field. First of all, I'm not a child and lesson psychiatrist. This is a big discussion here in this country. There's also as it relates to, to medication and pharmaceutical um, industry. So I don't want to get into this. First, no, no, I, but this is, I, I, but I think um, you have to carefully watch that. You have, if, if there is a need for medication, if, if everything is so disturbing, if, if it's so disruptive, Sure, we have medication at our hand, and we should use it. But we should always monitor it. We should see where there is an improvement. Um, of course, lithium is uh, is a drug that um, I mean, you have to be you have to monitor uh, kidney function, thyroid function. So, in a kid, it would be 
you also have to be careful about that. There are, there are some guidelines in, in KID, you wouldn't do it at that point. But I think, um, I, I think you have to be very careful about it. You have to closely monitor that. But again, you know, I'm not a child and lesson psychiatrist, so I would be careful about giving advice here. I just think, yes, we have to be aware of the fact that these disorders start early, and we shouldn't dismiss that. Yeah, we're going to do one more question, and then, yes, How about, oh, okay, Red. Hi, Mary Lou Salo. I'm not, uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. I want to thank Thomas on behalf of all the bipolar patients <laughs> for the tremendous work he's doing with all his energy and his intelligence and his passion uh, that ha bipolar people only have in their very best hypomanic days. Thank you, Thomas. Right, right. But you are biased, Mary Lou. You are so biased. Thank you, but you are biased. And we want to thank, thank Mary Lou Salo, who actually made some wonderful yeah. contributions uh, in, the, in the past in this organization.